Okay, so page 46. We're looking at these questions at the bottom on page 46. Whoops. So let's see what we got. I guess I assigned number three. I meant to assign number four, but that's all right. We'll, we'll just talk about number three, and then we'll maybe see what you think about number four. So use the particle model to draw a motion diagram for a car that starts from rest, speeds up to constant speed, and then slows to a stop. All right? Fair enough. Who wants to give that a shot? Can I draw it? Yes, you can. Come on up. Come draw it. <laughs> there you go, right here. There you go. You can use the fancy for me. Are you boxes? What boxes? Liking it? Very nice. Those are great dots, too. <laughs> okay, what do we think? <laughs> Phenomenal. Love it. Nice work. Okay, so yeah, speeds up. So remember, when we're drawing what the book calls a motion diagram, really all this is, it's like a strobe photography, right? We're taking it, we got a red ball moving along between frames, but doesn't move very far. It must have a slower velocity, moves further, it's faster velocity. Very nice. Okay, here's the challenge. Let's see, and I know you haven't had a chance to think about this, so we'll just do our best. Uh, what do you think about number four? What about if we were to use the particle model to draw a motion diagram for a wheel of an auto turning at a constant speed? Okay, let's assume the wheel is touching the ground and doesn't slip. Let's start off by placing the dot at the hub of the wheel. Hub's in the middle, yeah. Okay, so is that going to be any different from Peyton's diagram that she just drew? Shouldn't be any different, should it? Because it's, it's staying in the middle the whole time, right? Okay, good. All right, but what about if we do the second part of this? Would it make any difference if the dot were placed on the rim of the wheel? It'd be like one of the bottoms. Yeah, well, like, well, like if we if we measured it at the exact point every time it turned, it would be the same, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, but what's it? So what's it going to look like if we if we take these strobe pictures though? Let's just even look at like maybe one revolution of the tire. That's a little trickier, isn't it? What's that going to look like? So let's say that uh, I'm going to draw a ground here for you. I'll put a, uh, this is the, that's the ground. What's the wheel going to look like this time? Well, the wheel is still moving forward, correct? Well, is the wheel just like moving in the air? Well, it, it's touching the ground. Oh, no, it has not seen it. Yeah, then it doesn't slip, so it just stays in the same spot. No, right. Okay, but slip, but but the, but it is turning, right? Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> if the wheel's touching the ground, then it doesn't okay, okay. slip. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Get out of here. so would you agree then when it's when it's touching the ground? Let's say it's touching the ground right here. Okay. okay. How if, if the radius of the wheel is r, how far is it going to travel before it touches the ground again? Okay, but how? What's the distance it's going to travel? I heard it. I think two pi r, right? Because how come? Well, what's what's the circumference of a circle? Two pi r. <laughs> and so imagine imagine this. Imagine that you put uh, that you put wet paint on the wheel, and you went around one revolution. Wouldn't all points of the tire have touched the ground one time? Agreed. And so it would have it would have painted a, a segment that would be equal to the circumference of the tire, two pi r, right? Okay, so let's just say this is out there two pi r. So that's when it's going to hit the ground again. My question is, what does it do in between? This is an interesting question, kind of a challenging. 
It's going to have to go in an arc, isn't it? Right? Would it, would it go more of like, um, like an arc and then kind of like down in the line and back up in the arc? Because would be the point of the tire when it goes down? It's, no, it's, it's going up. It, you're right. Okay, so so if this is the first time it hits the ground, you're right. It's going to have to dip back to the ground. Let me ask you this. When is the dot of paint going to be traveling the fastest? At the top. Yeah, think about that. At the top, if this is our tire, say, yeah, it's, don't try that at home. Okay, so, so everybody agrees. Up here at the top, it's going to be moving the fastest, isn't it? Now think about this. If the, if the center of the wheel, we can be tricky with this. If, let's say the car is traveling at 10 meters per second. Okay, How fast is the point in contact with the ground moving? It's no. zero. zero, right? Because it's not sliding on the ground, right? It's rolling, okay? So that one's moving zero. This point in the middle is traveling, we'll represent it with a vector, how about, is traveling at 10 meters per second. How fast do you think your point at the top is going to have to move? 20. 20. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Because it's going to be, it's going to have two components. There's two things adding to its velocity. It's moving along with the center, right? But then the fact that the tire is rolling means that it also has to be rolling along at a speed of 10 meters per second. So it, does that make sense? It's going to be traveling 20. It's right? like when you gear something, when you put like a large gear on the motor, the small gear with it, there's a small gear. Sure. Yeah, the longer, and, and we'll talk about this with rotational motion later, but what we're going to see is that the further you are from the center of, of the rotation, the faster the linear velocity is. Later in the year, we'll, that'll make sense to you. Okay, but we can probably sort of visualize this now. So then, wouldn't you agree that, that if, we, if we're going to do this consistent with the way Peyton did this, then we're going to have to have the dots furthest apart up here, right? Where is he going to be traveling the slowest? At the bottom. Yeah. At the very bottom, think about this. In the first just nanosecond after the, the tire rolls past the ground, its motion is really only upward very slowly, right? Does that make sense? No, because it's barely moving. So this little piece right here, as the tire rolls away, it's just going to get pulled up very slowly. But as it, get, as it gets towards the top and gets further away from the point of rotation, it's going to go faster. But would it, the problem we did before, wouldn't it look kind of like that? It would. It, right. So it would look like this. Yeah. So then we're going to want to put the, the little red dots are going to have to be pretty far apart up here, right? Because it's going pretty fast. But as we get down here closer to the edge, I didn't, here, let me redo that. Probably be easier to start down here. Okay. Work. So they're going to go kind of like this. Right? Kind of like that. You see what I'm saying? They're going to go further apart up there. Something like that. Well, that's pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah. See how that works? And then it just start another rotation here, so then it would just be off like this again. Right? Okay. Tricky. Does that make sense? Okay. So I think really the value of that makes you think a little bit, which is always good. But it kind of gives you gives you an idea that there's a little bit to explore here, right? I mean, it's not as simple. Even something like just a tire rolling on the ground, the motion gets a little bit complicated, right? That's where physics comes in. Helps us understand that. All right. Moving on. So now we're up to, let's see, what are we up to here? Page 60. Oops. Okay. Number three. How does a vector quantity differ from a scalar quantity? Maverick, what do you think? Vector quantity differ from a scalar quantity. 
perfect. Okay. Vector quantity has both magnitude and a directionality with it. Scalar requires only a number or a magnitude. Good. Questions on that? Does that make sense? So scalar is more simple than vector. It is. So scalar is more simple. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what we're going to find next chapter, this is kind of getting us ready for next chapter. <clears throat> we're going to talk, really, next chapter is mostly about just learning how to deal with vectors. Scalars are easy. You've had practice with scalars your whole life. Adding, subtracting, multiplying numbers, real numbers. That's how we deal with scalars. Vectors are a little bit different, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, let's see. Number four. The following quantities describe location or its change. Position, distance, and displacement. Which are vectors? Which are vectors? So what do we think here? Haley, what do you think? Which of those? Position, distance, and displacement. I said position and displacement. And you are exactly correct. Position and displacement both require a direction. Distance does not, right? Uh, which of those quantities could be negative? Displacement and position, right? Distance cannot. Distance is always positive. Scalars are always positive. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain position? Yeah, yeah, you betcha. So position, <clears throat> here's what we mean by, by position. So the way we've kind of talked about it so far, we really only talked about it in one dimension. Right? We said that, we said, for example, that if like this is our starting line, this is zero, then on this line on the front of the room, my position right now is positive 2, measured relative to that point, right? My position right now would be at negative 1. Does that make sense? So my displacement going from here to there is positive 3, right? Because I have two ways to look at that. The motion is in the positive direction, and I covered a distance from my beginning to my end of 3, right? A better way to think about it is, my final position minus my initial position, which is the definition of displacement, is positive 2 meters minus negative 1 meters is positive 3 meters. If I start here and end here, that's a displacement of negative 3 because my final position is negative 1 and my initial is positive 2. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, right? So the important thing to remember here is that Position identifies a location relative to some agreed upon reference point. We said it was right here, right? But remember the analogy we did the other day. I could have made the agreed upon reference point that wall over there, okay? It'd be a different story. Let's say instead of starting at negative one and ending at positive two, I might start at negative seven and end at negative four, right? But my displacements are the same. In both cases, it would be positive 3. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to see next chapter is this. What we're going to see next chapter is if, for example, If, for example, this is our reference point, then this vector right here might represent our initial position. Okay, we'll call that D naught. Okay. Our final position might be represented by this vector right there. We'll call that D1. What we're going to see next chapter is then that, and we can kind of even see it now, our displacement is just going to be this position vector minus this one. In other words, what do you think it's going to look like? It's going to be an arrow that starts where? Okay, you'd think so. I, I kind of see where people are getting You'd think it would start at the origin, but really all it's doing is starting there and ending there. Okay. That's going to make a lot more sense in about three or four days when we're talking about the next chapter about vectors. Well, one of the things I'm going to say to you right from the beginning is we add vectors up tip to tail. 
And I don't want to jump the gun too much, but it's a really good question. So then what we're going to see is that if we were to write this, this is going to make sense <clears throat> kinematically, right? If I say that initial position plus displacement has to equal, whoops, has to equal final position, right? Because how do we <coughs> define displacement? Displacement is just final position minus initial position, right? Does that make sense? Okay. As a vector, we'll reconcile this with the vector nature of, of these quantities, like position and displacement, soon. Because if we add these vectors up tip to tail, this vector plus this vector, we have to add them tip to tail. So that means I'm going to put the tip of my first vector connecting to the tail of the second vector. That's going to create the resultant or the answer when we add them up, right? So this starting vector plus this displacement gives me this final position. <coughs> That's going to sound a little confusing because we haven't talked about vectors yet, but does that sort of answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good question? No? You looked quizzical. You're thinking of a question. No, All right. This is rest quizzical <laughs> Uh huh. Okay. All right, so moving on. Number six, what's the difference between average velocity and average speed? Average velocity and average speed. And let's see. Uh, Caleb, what do you think? Average velocity is displacement divided by the time interval, while average speed is the ratio of distance traveled to the time interval. Okay, good. So average velocity is <coughs> displacement over time. Average speed is distance traveled over time. So somebody, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I won't pick on anybody. I'll let you volunteer for this one. I want you to think of a great story, maybe a front of the room story, that would exemplify why they're so different. How could we come up with a trip that would have a dramatically different average velocity than its average speed? What, what would I do? Okay, and that's right. Does that make sense? That's what we talked about earlier. If I start here, let's say I walk this direction for two seconds, I walk out to four meters, and then I walk back to zero in a total of four seconds. What's my displacement? Zero. So my average velocity is zero. My average speed, though, I walked out four and came back four, so a total of eight meters in four seconds. So my average speed was two meters per second. Right? Very different. Okay. All right. How are velocity and acceleration related? And let's go, Abby. What do you think? Um, both are vector quantities behind the direction. Okay. Good. Both are vector quantities. Excellent. What else can we add to that? Somebody. What do you think? Any ideas? Average velocity is also acceleration. Okay. Yeah. And true. What is our definition of average acceleration? What's that look like? What is average acceleration? Okay, good. So it's going to be delta V over delta T, right? Okay. What's average velocity? Okay, good. Delta D over delta T, right? So once again, you see that reciprocal relationship, right? If I just let, if I'm going to let D go to V and V go to A, I get this, right? D is to D is to V as V is to A or vice versa, right? Okay, that'll become more apparent soon when we start looking at graphical analysis of motion. Okay, what else? 
Number 11. Okay, yeah, this is this is kind of a good one now. Test the following combinations and explain. You have to test them. Just explain why. Explain why each does not have the properties needed to describe the concept of velocity. So if you were trying to remember what velocity was, and you're pretty sure it was one of these four choices, what's one compelling reason why you wouldn't have to look very long at number one? Ah, okay, the units don't work at all, do they? Right? The units of this first choice here, delta D plus delta T, they don't even work at all, right? That's not even a consistent quantity. I can only add up quantities that have the same units, right? They have to be like terms. Well, delta D and delta T aren't even the same units. So they don't they don't even match, right? So that one we can just cross off immediately. Same with number two. Delta D minus delta T. Right? I'm going to get units of meters minus seconds. What's that? Uh, what about number three? To describe the concept of velocity. Number three, delta D times delta T. Does that work? No, I'm going to get meters times seconds. Okay. <laughs> I didn't look at this one very closely, but what did you find on this? Yeah, none of them really work, do they? Uh, the last one, I guess, is the one that if you had to pick one, that would be maybe the one because it's seconds per meter, and I could take the reciprocal of that and make it meters per second. But really, none of those are perfect, are they? So, whoops. I think that must be a misprint. I don't know why they even have it in. Oh, it does not have. Awesome. See, I knew what I was doing. Whole time. <laughs> so, so none of them work, do they? None of them have the right units. What do we call that? You remember? Trick question. No. Okay. <laughs> what do we call that when we appeal to the units to, just to check to see if, if it could work? Dimensional, Dimensional analysis. analysis. Yeah. Good. Okay. It's a good little trick. Okay. Number 12. When can a football be considered a point particle, Mr. Jennings? What do you think? Number 12, yeah. <laughs> what do you have to do? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do it. Well, that's okay. You can, you can, you can, that's all right, though. So you can still dig it out here. You got it. So when can a football be considered a point particle? When can we consider, remember we said, we talked about in class, how when we're drawing or representing objects that we want to do something to. And we'll do this throughout the year, right? We want to, we, we like to turn them into points. But what do we have to do? And I guess I didn't go into too much detail. The reading kind of expands on that a little bit. I'll give you a break. You did the other one. So somebody else help him out. Yes, sir? Okay, you throw it. But when, when can you consider it to be a point based on the reading? What do you think? Okay, well, spiraling would actually be kind of important because it's then it's spinning around an important place. What do you think? Uh, we can take a video with a very low uh, temperature setting. Okay. Okay. But this... There's, there's something in the reading here. I'm just going to go to it. There's, if you go back, I think it's probably way back at the beginning. It's got to be, it's kind of the beginning back here. So, let's go away. There we go. Picturing motion, okay. Particle model, okay? Okay, what's this saying? So keeping track of the motion of the runner, remembering those pictures we looked at on the first day, is easier if you disregard moving arms and legs and concentrate on a single point at the center of her body. So then that, that's when we can kind of consider this a particle. But in order for this to work, the particle has to be, technically it's going to have to be at the center of the object, right? Center of mass. That's We'll get to that more later. But it has to, the... The, the, the figure really needs to be relatively small compared to the distances that we're talking about, right? Does that make sense? Like they talk, so for example, in this case, if we put a central point on, on the runner, like a knot on her belt or something, we could look at that, uh, and we can just focus on the particle, right? 
But where where did, I thought I saw this in here? Did they not talk about this? Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll we'll disregard this one. Uh, that's weird. Maybe it was from. Maybe it was back from chapter two. <laughs> yeah. Well. Get used to it. I I <laughs> forgot to teach you something. Uh, okay. Well, let's talk about it. Not a big deal. We won't grade it. Let's just talk about it. So th this really is, is only going to work well in the future when we get into more complicated stuff. Where are we? Right. Is that us right there somewhere? Yeah, number 12. Okay, this really is only going to work well when we're dealing with situations like this. Where the object that we're talking about is not huge compared to the point. Well, well the, the, the distance that the object is moving is not huge compared to the size of the object, right? So for example, if if we had like a, let's say that we had a building that for some reason fell over, so it toppled over, right? Well, its center of mass, in this case, starts right here, and it's just going to describe that kind of motion. That's not a good model, right? There's a lot going on with that building other than just the, just the, the, the toppling of its, of its center of mass, right? I mean, you can see that this point on the building isn't moving at all. That point's moving really fast. See what I'm saying? But if we took this building and this building were orbiting around, orbiting around the sun up here for whatever reason, and that building were going to spiral into the sun, and it was traveling through millions of kilometers through space, yeah, what difference does it make? We just treat it as a particle, right? Maybe it's spinning a little bit, but who cares? The spinning is a tiny part of this trajectory, right? And so in that in that situation, yeah, it makes sense. We'll just treat it like a particle. Does that make sense? You see what I'm getting at? It's only when when the distances that the object is moving are large compared to the size of the object that the particle model works well. We'll get into a little more detail later, but I'll just mention this now. Being as it's football season, let's look at this. Um, if we've got a football down here, and we're going to kick the football, in what sense, how can I kick the football and have it not spin? You have to kick like a whole side of it. OK, so if this is the center of mass, and I'm jumping way ahead here, but this is just be one. We'll come back to this. But if the force vector acting on the football, if it points right through the center of the football, through the center of mass, then the football would just travel through the air without spinning, right? If I kick the football way down here, though, for example, something different is going to happen, right? Then, sure, the football is going to get launched down the field, and a lot of the energy that I impart to the football and the kick is going to translate it, but there's going to be also a significant amount of that energy that does what to the football? Rotates it. Rotates it, right? Okay, so once again, in those cases, which of those two scenarios would best be fit by a particle model? That one, right? Yeah, where we're kicking it through the center of mass and it's not spinning. You can really see the spin of a particle, right? It just looks like a dot. It's spinning, it looks the same. Okay, anyway, ignore that one. Don't grade that one. OK. What else do we got? 14 through 16. OK, when you enter a toll road, your, your toll ticket is stamped 1 PM. When you leave after traveling 55 miles, your ticket is stamped 2 PM. What was your average speed in miles per hour? We'll just go ahead. What do we got? 55 miles per hour. 55 miles per hour. <laughs> Could you ever have gone faster than that average speed? Yeah. Well, well, if yes, yes, because yes, slower as well. Well, the, the toll, okay, are you on a train? Or like, <laughs> like, I you assume you're in a car. In a car? Oh, okay. How could you have? You stopped. What do you think? Peter, go ahead. What do you got? Press on the gas pedal. Press on the gas pedal. <laughs> yeah, there you go. If you press on the gas pedal, you had NOS and you went exactly 55 from when you left the toll gate. 
And then you just stay to 55 the entire time. Okay, so yeah, let's look at that. So one scenario would be, and that, I don't know if the, if the toll booth operator is going to appreciate that very much. If you're coming through, you're coming through hot there at 55. And you're going to keep the cruise on the whole time. I don't know. Uh, but that's one scenario, right, that you kept it at 55 the whole way. Let's say that you didn't, though. Let's say that I want to see how this impacts it. Let's say that we started at rest, and we're going to end up at 55 when we go through the other end of the toll booth. But if I start at rest, for my average speed we're talking about here, is that what it says? Yeah. Average, for my average speed to be 55, if I'm going to go through the other toll booth at 55, yeah. what must I do? Speed up a lot. Okay. So you have to go more than I'm going to have to go more than 55. Agreed? Yes. For the average to be 55, if I started below 55, then I'm going to have to make up that ground, so to speak, and go a little faster, right? Point being that average speed or average velocity depends only on what? Well, no. I mean, if I'm making a calculation, it only depends on. What did you say? Time. Time and. Okay, and total elapsed distance or displacement, depending on which quantity we're talking about, right? It really says nothing about what's going on during the journey. It's only reliant on the endpoints. I want to make a connection to you, a math connection with that. Uh, this is something, and you'll thank me in your math classes when this comes up. So this is what we call, let's look at a function. We'll talk about this a lot in, in calculus. This is a big deal. So if let's say this is a this is a mathematical function. So we'll just call that f or f of x, right? Let's say we're going to start at some value. Oh, we'll just call it a, and we're going to end at some value b. Okay. If I want to describe, and this might be a, uh, this might be like a position versus time, a distance versus time graph would even work. Let's say that's what our, what our, you know, what this really is here is distance versus time. If I connect these two points right there, or yeah, position versus time. If I connect those two points, what's significant about that red line? It shows the average because it goes so are we going slower than that faster? That, how is that tell the average? It does. Because it goes in the yeah, middle because you started at a certain point and then you went and then you went. Back. Are we going faster or slower? Okay. Well, th this is let's say this is displacement or, or position as a function of time, right? So then this point right here, we'll call this instead of a, we'll call that t naught, t sub zero, and we'll call this t sub one, right? So what, if I want to like look at this line, I know these two points right here. Well, what's the y value right here? Zero, zero. How would we, how would we, what would we call that if I'm measuring position? Uh, okay. This is my time zero. D naught. D naught. It's my initial position, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's. So what's this? This is going to be my time, this is going to be my position at T1, so. D1. D1. Okay. What's the slope? Let's, let's make a slope triangle. What's that? What's my rise here? D1 minus D2. What do we call that? D1 minus D1. Yeah, but we have, we have a name for that. Position minus initial position is final position minus initial position is. Uh, uh, I heard, didn't I hear? Delta D. Displacement. Delta D. Displacement. What's my run? What's my run? Delta D. Delta D. So the slope of this red line is what? Okay, which is delta D over delta T, which is what? Average velocity, right? So average velocity is technically a slope. It is on that kind of graph, and we'll talk more about that. I keep saying we'll do that, but we're just barely scratching the surface on this stuff now. It's kind of just a big introduction. So yeah. So if we look at a position time graph, and we're looking only at the starting point and the ending point on the graph, 
then the slope of that line is an average rate of change. It doesn't just have to be for position and time. It could be for f and x. It could be just totally arbitrary math variables, right? But still, if I take a line that's connecting two points on a graph, the slope of that line is the average rate of change of the function, whatever it may represent, right? We call that kind of a line a secant line. Secant line is a line that, on purpose, intersects a function in more than one place so we can look at an average rate of change. Okay, now this is, if we want to move on to, let's say we want to know exactly, and this is getting pretty advanced here, let's say we want to look at what the instantaneous velocity is at this point right here. Let's call this point uh, C, okay? Well, actually, it's supposed to be a time, so we'll call it. We'll call it T sub two. Okay. So at T point at T sub two, if I want to represent the instantaneous velocity, how do you think I would do that? Can I come up with a line that represents an instantaneous velocity? Yes. Any ideas what that would look like? Would it be probably you guys the would it be undefined? No. You could just get the value of that and calculate it. Wouldn't it? We got an idea? Ideas? We need to explain. We want to try to draw the line? Where's this? This is scary. Well, would it, would, like, well, the, would, it, would you have to put like a dot in the middle of the displacement? And, like, draw like a curve? That goes through the dot. Down to the bottom of the okay, let, let, let's. I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna give you. Let's open this up just a little bit. Maybe this will help. Let's look at three discrete points. Let's look at a point here near the beginning, and a point near the end, and a point in the middle. What can you tell me if I look at this graph of position versus time? During which of those three points? At which of those three points am I probably traveling the fastest? How come? Because. Anybody got a different answer? Uh, the, the one at the top, because that is taking the smallest amount of time to go to the right distance. Okay, Scott? Uh, it would be the middle because it's farthest away from our average. Uh, no, it is the top one, but let's see if we can figure out why. Now, now think about the, this red line. The, the slope of the red line represents the, the speed, right? In this case, it's our velocity, same thing, average speed or average velocity. So the units of slope here are going to be in units of vertical units, which are meters, and horizontal units, which are seconds. So wouldn't you agree then that the steeper the slope, the higher the velocity? Yes. Okay, now looking at this curve, where is this blue curve slanted most steeply of those three points? Right there, right? Okay, what about, if you remember talking about tangent lines? So what is, what is the, you, do you guys, you must have talked about tangent lines at some point. If not, we'll talk about it now. What is the definition of a tangent line? It touches a curve. It touches it one time, but it's more than just that, because by that definition, that's a tangent line. It has to touch the curve at one point. But what else does it have to do? Touch, but not intersect. It has to touch, it has to, a good way of saying it, saying it is it has to graze the function. It has to touch the function in one place, but as I were, as I, if I were to, for example, focus in on this point, and I were to focus in and focus in and focus in, as I zoomed in, what's going to happen to the curvature of the curve as I zoom in and zoom in and zoom in? It's, exactly. it's going to start to straighten out, right? The Earth is, I promise you, the Earth is spherical. You can't prove that, though, by just walking outside because these wheat fields make it look pretty flat, right? But from the moon, you can block the entire Earth out with your thumb. So it clearly does have a highly rounded surface, curved surface, right? You get the idea? Uh, we'll come back. Okay, and we're, we're going to go ahead, just so you have a heads up. We're going to do a little test on Tuesday over just the problem sets. Okay?